Hello, hello. Where were we? <laughs> For those of you that turned tuned in last time, you know we had an internet problem. I actually deleted that last video and I'm going to try and do it all over again. But in the interim, I did get a new setup. Some people had some good suggestions, so I got something that hopefully has improved our internet speed. Well, I mean, we already had good internet speed. The problem is my computer now is quite a distance from the the modem and router and all that. So uh, I had to do something to make things better. I'm hoping there's no glitches this time. There shouldn't be any glitches. If there are glitches, then I did a whole lot of work and it's a little uh, for little to do. Uh, so Daniel says the place looks great. And actually, I've got a lot more to do. Uh, so this is a garage. I'll try and show you. Let me let me take my uh, little camera here and show you a little bit. I actually did the flooring. Uh, well, there's a bunch of stuff around. But you can see that I put down something on the floor. I have a, a few bookshelves up, but most of the books are still in boxes. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's not perfectly situated yet. Uh, in addition, it's hotter than all get out around here and humid. So I wanted to get a bit of a, some kind of a cooling system, but the guy wanted to charge an astronomical amount to install it. The, apparently, you can do a lot of it yourself, but there's something about the electrical that it didn't seem to me like I was outfitted for and I thought I'd need somebody to come in and do the installation and all that so I had a guy come out here and appraise it and he told me it would cost 5,000 bucks and I said ah, I'll just sweat it out <laughs> I'm not forking over five thousand dollars anytime soon uh, so anyways um, I'll work that out somehow I do have a fan blowing on me at the moment I hope it's not causing any uh, feedback for you guys. I hope the sound quality is good. In fact, um, how, how's the, I think the lighting is actually better. Maybe you guys can, can tell me if you think the lighting is better and also tell me if the sound quality is decent. Um, so Moses says there's no feedback disturbance. Great, great. So the, the fan is not, uh, so Acts 2 says the lighting is much better and sound is good. All right, great. And apparently also there are no glitches. So if that is the case, let me welcome all of you here. Uh, we are getting back into the Mark series. A uh, bit of a recap. I know I was doing that last time, but since I deleted that video, let me do that again. Uh, we've looked at Mark 1, verses 1 through 3. In Mark 1, we have a very clear statement of Mark's thesis, right? At the insipid of the book, right out of the gate, Mark tells us what this book is all about. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So already Mark identifies for the reader who Jesus is. And as you move through the gospel of Mark, it's apparent that Mark is using the term son of God in a transcendent sense. He's not identifying Jesus merely as an adoptive son, as is true of believers. Remember, according to the New Testament, believers are sons of God. We stand in a father-son relationship to God. But we do so by virtue of Christ, who is God's true and proper son, that is, by nature. This is indicated throughout the New Testament in numerous ways. One classic text on this is Galatians 4, where Paul says, In the fullness of time, God sent out from himself his son, 
He uses the Greek word ex apostelling, which is a very strong form of the word to send and indicates that Jesus, the son, is sent out from the father. And then Paul goes on to say, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem those who were under the law. And so it's evident, given the chronology that Paul is giving there, that the son is sent out from the father antecedent to his being made of a woman. That is, it results in his being made of a woman, which means that he is God's son independently of and prior to the virginal conception, right? And then Paul goes on to say, God sent out from himself the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so notice you have the same term, ex apostelene, being used here for the spirit who's sent from the father, right? So just like the spirit comes from the father, from heaven, he exists prior to uh, dwelling in our hearts, Likewise, the son exists as the son prior to his virginal conception. But the, the main point that I wanted to make here is that our sonship is said to be by virtue of the, uh, the spirit of, of Christ dwelling in us. And so Paul says that we receive the spirit of adoption. So Christ's sonship, according to the New Testament, is not an adoptive sonship. He doesn't become the son. Uh, it's also not the case that Jesus is a son merely in a uh, creative sense, right? We might say that somebody is a son. All you know, rational human creatures might be referred to as God's sons in the sense that he made them. But this is clearly not true in the case of Christ. Uh, and one of the ways, uh, or a, no a number of ways Mark does this, Mark in his gospel uh, for example, he modifies the term son with the Greek word agapetos. Okay, agapetos is the word that's translated beloved. And it's one of two Greek words that the Jews use to translate the Hebrew word yachid, right? Yachid is the word used for Isaac, for example, in Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice. There, the Greek or the Hebrew word is yachid for only son. And when that was translated into Greek, it's used about 12 times in the Old Testament. Sometimes the Jews would use the word agapetos, beloved. Other times they would use the term monogenes, which means only begotten. So agapetos, beloved, is the term used more often or really exclusively in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Monogenes is the term that John uses. Both of those are, are roughly synonymous, at least in this sense, that they are translating the same Hebrew word. And so Mark makes it clear that Jesus is God's son in some unique sense. He is the beloved of the Father. Uh, and of course, since it's roughly equivalent to monogenes, by virtue of being a translation of the same word that monogenes translates, uh, it also points up the exclusivity of Christ's sonship. Uh, it's also clear that Christ's sonship is, is transcendent or heavenly in Mark. Uh, one of the indications of this, and this is actually what reveals to us the plot of Mark's gospel, is the fact that although Mark has alerted us as the readers as, as to the identity of Christ, that he is the Son of God, none of the human beings in Mark's gospel know who Jesus is uh, you know, apart from, well, let's put it this way. Nobody in Mark's gospel ever identifies Jesus as the son until you get to the centurion in Mark 15. And we're going to talk eventually about why that's significant. But this shows you the plot, because as you're moving through Mark's gospel, the human beings in Mark's gospel are constantly scratching their heads saying, who is this man? Where did he get this wisdom? Why do the winds and the waves obey him, right? There's all these sorts of questions that the people in the narrative are asking. But uh, even though the human beings that are uh, in the narrative are asking this question, supernatural beings are identifying Jesus as the son of God at every turn. 
In Mark chapter 1, when the demons see Jesus, they run up and throw themselves at his feet and say, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. In Mark 3, they say the Son of God or the Son of the Most High God. The same thing in Mark chapter 5. Over and over again, the demons immediately recognize Jesus. They rush before him, throw themselves at his feet, and they beg him not to execute judgment. Right? They say, have you come to torment us or have you come to destroy us? So they believe, by virtue of knowing who he is, that his coming spells for them the crack of doom. Right, Jesus has come, he's the son of God, and therefore they believe he has come uh, to be the agent of their destruction. And that's significant, that's, that's uh, huge, right? Uh, for reasons we'll get into more in this episode, but, but at least this much should be recognized. These are supernatural beings who have an immediate awareness of who Jesus is. They're not like the human beings in a fog, right? They're, they're not uh, in any confusion over the proper identity of Jesus. We also have the repeated testimony of the Father. The Father at the baptism of Jesus says from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. There you have the term agapetos. Uh, and it's clear that this is not an adoption. You know, some people have said this, that Jesus is here being adopted as God's son. Part of the problem with that, and we'll see more, more along these lines, but part of the problem is, is, is this is a, a, an indication of Christ being adopted. What do you do with Mark 9 when the father repeats this statement? In Mark 9 at the transfiguration, the father says, this is my beloved son, hear him. So if this declaration from heaven is an indication, is some sort of uh, you know, coronation of Jesus as son, well, then you'd have Jesus being adopted as God's son twice. And that's just, uh, you know, that obviously would be redundant and ridiculous. Uh, but it, it, it's clear for Mark that Jesus is the son of God antecedent to the baptism. The baptism is the point at which this is being formally uh, acknowledged from heaven at, at John's baptism. But Jesus, as I've already pointed out, in previous episodes, is already identified as a divine person in verses 2 and 3, right? In Mark 1, it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then it goes on to say in verses 2 and 3, as it is written, and to be more literal, the Greek, it's uh, kathos gegraptai, which means just as it is written. And whenever you have that phrase, just as it is written, it always points back to what was just said and is indicating that what's going to follow is explanatory. In other words, when you have the phrase, just as it is written, this explains what's, what's about to be said, explains what was just said. And so what is it that Mark goes on to cite from the Old Testament by way of explication of this identification of Jesus as the Son of God? He goes on to cite a passage from Isaiah 40, the beginning of Isaiah's new exodus section, where he's talking about that future and greater exodus or redemptive act that God is going to accomplish to bring about the salvation of his people. At the beginning of that section, there's this prophecy which says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That text is intratextually related to two other passages, Exodus 23, 20 through 23, and Malachi 3, verse 1. When I say they're intratextually or intertextually related, what I mean is they pick up language. These texts all have some common language between them, which are a tip-off that they're talking about uh, the same thing, uh, or at least the, some of the same issues are involved in these passages. And uh, if you want the fuller... A rundown of this, you have to go back and listen to those previous episodes. But the Malachi 3 text, uh, God says, Behold, I'll send my messenger ahead of me, and, and or I'll send my messenger ahead of me, and he'll prepare the way before me. Uh, and then it says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you desire. So by citing these two texts, 
both of which identify the coming one as a divine person, right? The Isaiah text calls him the Lord, which is Jehovah or Yehovah or Yahweh in, in Hebrew. By citing Isaiah 40, which says the coming one is the Lord, and Malachi 3.1, where it, again, is the Lord who's coming, there the, the Hebrew is ha-adon. It uses not only the word adon for Lord, but it uses the definite article, the Lord. So Mark cites two Old Testament texts identifying the coming one as a divine person. Okay, And again, remember, this is given by way of explication of the first verse. When Mark identifies this as the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then goes on to cite two Old Testament texts about the coming of a divine person, Jehovah or the Lord, it's clear that Mark is not identifying Jesus merely as a human being, not even the highest or most exalted of creatures, but as the very Son of God. And to uh, you know, ramp this up even further, um, okay, uh, anyway, hold on, I'll get to that. I, I saw a text that I'll get to in a bit. Um, so, uh, Mark, Mark takes these two Old Testament texts and he gives them a prosopological cast, which means, as I, as I was explaining last time in the now deleted broadcast, um, Mark recognizes that often when the, the Old Testament, here and there, I should say, the Old Testament presents a prophet when he receives revelation being caught up into God's heavenly presence or, uh, you know, in some way he's ushered into the divine presence. You know, an example of this very uh, uh, well-known one is Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord lofty and exalted, and, you know, the train of his robe filled the temple. The angels were crying out, holy, holy, holy. What Isaiah is reporting is this heavenly scene, which he is privy to. And he's reporting what he's hearing the Lord saying. Sometimes he's reporting what he hears the Lord saying to others. Sometimes he's reporting what he hears the Lord saying to himself. So recognizing this fact, the New Testament writers will sometimes present Old Testament texts that are simply written as straightforward predictions they'll often present them as words that were originally addressed uh, to someone in the hearing of the prophet. Uh, I'll give you uh, one example. Um, in, uh, in Hebrews 1, 8, it quotes Psalm 45, right? Uh, Hebrews 1, 8, it says, About the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever and righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Notice that Psalm 45, uh, if you read the psalm, it's just it, it sounds almost as if the psalmist is making this statement, but when the author of Hebrews cites it, he cites it as words that were addressed by the Father to the Son or about the Son, right? There are other texts like this. Um, in fact, some texts in the Old Testament come right out and do this, right? In Psalm 110, it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. There in Psalm 110, there, there's, there's no need for any New Testament authors to give this a prosopological cast. It's already presented as words that were being addressed to someone, namely to David's Lord. Okay, so uh, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because if you look at Mark 1.1, 1, 1, or 1.1 1, 1 through 3, in fact, let me share my screen. Um, all right. Uh, so here is Mark 1. Let me blow it up as big as I can for you. Notice how Mark renders these words. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Okay. Notice that as Mark cites these texts, he presents them as words that are being addressed 
to someone. Okay? And we know from the context who that someone is, whose way is being prepared, who's, uh, who has a messenger that's being sent ahead of him. Well, in Mark uh, 1, 4 through 11, we're told about John the Baptist coming to prepare the way for Jesus. But notice, these words, according to Mark, were being addressed to the Son. It is to the Son that the Father says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. So the, the relevant question here is, not only who is being spoken of, which is obviously Jesus in context, but when were these words being addressed to Jesus? Okay, Notice that these verses that Mark cites are uh, take place prior to the narrative. Okay, we haven't even gotten into the the narrative yet. Okay, verses two and three are presented as words being spoken by the Father to the Son, antecedent to the sending of John the Baptist. Before John the Baptist ever arrives on the scene, these words had already been addressed to the Lord Jesus. Moreover, since these are Old Testament texts that were heard originally by the prophet, they, they're the, the scene, and, and this is borne out by other things that I pointed out in those previous broadcasts, this scene is a pre-temporal heavenly scene where the Father is addressing the Son. So over and over again, in the first three verses, Mark has indicated in various ways that Jesus is a divine person. And, uh, and by the way... Uh, Notice that uh, Mark uses the future tense here, right? Uh, it says, behold, I send, or uh, he uses the uh, uh, futuristic present here. Uh, but then he said he uses the future right here, who will prepare your way. So very clearly, these are words spoken uh, before the sending of John. So already Jesus is being addressed by the Father before we even get into the narrative. So Mark has already made it clear for the reader who Jesus is. Now let's read uh, verses 4 through 8 to get us into, into today's topic. Okay, starting in verse 4, reading through verse 8, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching, saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, or stronger than I. That's the, the Greek word there, uh, iskurateros, can be translated either mightier or stronger, and then he says, and I'm not fit to bend down and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now I'm going to come back to John in future episodes, probably the next episode. But in order to really see what's going on here with John, we really have to understand what John is telling us about Jesus. Right. It's clear that John is making a contrast between himself and Jesus. Right, John comes baptizing. Jesus is going to baptize too. But in contradistinction to John, who is engaging in a uh, preaching a baptism of repentance, Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Uh, one way of drawing out the implications of this is to say that John is applying to people the sign Jesus is going to pour out the reality. Okay, John is uh, preparatory, but Jesus is the, the, the real deal. Jesus is going to ultimately bestow on people the Spirit, uh, which is the one of the if not the central and chief promises of uh, the Old Covenant, uh, what people ultimately need. Remember, uh, throughout the Old Covenant, the people of Israel are constantly upbraided for not keeping the law, and the prophets will often uh, say the reason they're not keeping the law is because they don't have circumcised hearts, right? Moses in Deuteronomy, uh, I think it's 30, 
uh, in Deuteronomy 30 says that you don't have circumcised hearts to obey the Lord. And so when you come to the prophets, they, they prophesy that the Lord is going to circumcise the heart. And how's he going to do that? By pouring out his spirit. So the spirit is necessary to give people a circumcised heart uh, that will enable them to uh, uh, keep the covenant. Okay, so, uh, but here's uh, a quote that I want to uh, use as, as kind of a foil to get into uh, what I want to focus on today. Uh, and it's a quote from Brendan Dempsey called The Combat Myth According to Mark. Okay, now I am going to have to uh, explain some of these things. I hope people will hear out my explanation, you know, before they they jump to any conclusions on some of this. But Dempsey says Mark portrays Jesus as the eschatological divine warrior who repeats Yahweh's primordial acts of battling the evil forces of chaos, sea and dragon. Victorious, he then enters Jerusalem in a triumphant procession modeled on ancient Israel's cultic enshrinement of the combat myth, the New Year Festival. There, still following the mytho-cultic paradigm, he repurifies the temple and its environs, assumes kingship at his enthronement on the cross, and battles the final chaos enemy, death. Now, uh, the first thing I want to explain, lest anybody... Uh, misunderstand this, uh, is the term myth here. Now, some people assume that the word myth, when used in academic contexts, uh, means a fable or something that's not true. Uh, but really, this is a term. Now, some scholars may well mean that, you know, uh, but the term itself uh, doesn't carry that inherent idea, right? That might be uh, the connotation for some scholars, but it's not the denotative meaning of the word. Okay, and uh, what all they're trying to do is they're trying to use a term, and and in any case, whatever some scholar might mean, all I mean by this term is what you know, uh, you know, scholars recognize is the the basic meaning of it, which is uh, any any uh, story or account of things. Uh, that people had explaining their origins, uh, who they are, where they come from, uh, you know, that, that involve some sort of uh, uh, supernatural uh, background, right? Uh, it, it's just, uh, it, you know, th there's probably a cleaner definition I could give you, but I'm hoping you at least get the gist, right? The, the basic idea is that it's a culture's uh, explanation of its its origin, its history, and so forth. And every religion has something along these lines. Okay. Now, obviously, I don't think the Old Testament account of things is a fable or untrue or anything like that. And that's not how Dempsey is using the word in any case. Uh, but uh, there's more to this uh, that, that Dempsey says, but I'm going to focus on this first part where he says, Mark portrays Jesus as the eschatological divine warrior who repeats Yahweh's primordial acts of battling the evil forces of Kitsi and Dragon. Okay, Now, I wonder if you guys have noticed how often Mark uses uh, the word the sea. Okay. Uh, in Mark 1, he refers to it as the Sea of Galilee. More often than not, he just refers to it as the Sea. Okay. In fact, the only time he calls it the Sea of Galilee is here in Mark 1, 16, and then later in Mark 7, 31, which is actually the last time he refers to the Sea, meaning when he's talking about uh, a specific location. Okay. So, Mark repeatedly calls it the Sea of Galilee. You see that in Mark 1. You see that in Mark 3, where he calls it the Sea. Jesus withdrew to the Sea with his disciples. Uh, Mark 4, it says he began to teach again by the Sea. Uh, later, it says that, uh, uh, or in the same uh, sentence, uh, or excuse me, same passage, it says, such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the Sea and sat down. Uh, Mark 4, again, it says, he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. 
Uh, later in Mark 4, it said, uh, the people said, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Again, in Mark 5, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. Uh, Mark 5, again, it makes reference to the sea. Mark 6, the sea, the sea, the sea. Uh, and then finally, the, the Mark 731 passage says uh, uh, they, they came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. Now, why is this all significant? Well, uh, let me read for you something from an early critic of Christianity named Porphyry. Okay, uh, this is Porphyry's criticism of Mark. Okay, this is a uh, Porphyry was a third-century Neoplatonic pagan philosopher, and he uh, wrote in against or he wrote against Christianity. In fact, his book is called Against the Christians. And here's what he says. He says, another section in the gospel deserves comment. He's talking about Mark's gospel. For it's likewise devoid of sense and full of implausibility. I mean that absurd story about Jesus sending his apostles across the sea ahead of him after a banquet, then walking across to them at the fourth watch of the night. It's related that they had been working all night to keep the boat adrift and were frightened by the size of the storm surging against the boat. Um, and... Uh, Actually, I didn't, I didn't provide the full quote. I thought I had the full quote on here. What, what Porphyry uh, objects to here, among other things, is the fact that Mark refers to it as the sea. I'm sorry for not having the full quote. Uh, Porphyry objects because uh, in the first century, uh, well, in, in Hebrew, you have the word yam, which can be used to refer to fresh water and salt water, right? But in Greek, there are two different words that uh, distinguish between fresh water and salt water. There's the term thalasse, which refers to uh, uh, the sea. And then there's the term limne, which refers to uh, a lake. Okay. In fact, notice how Luke repeatedly refers to uh, the, the same body of water. He refers to it as the Lake of Gennesaret. Now, uh, there's no discrepancy here in terms of Gennesaret or Galilee. The, the, the lake uh, was called by many names, Gennesaret. Uh, uh, John even calls it the lake or the sea. John uses the term the sea, the Sea of Tiberias. In fact, in one place, John even calls it the Sea of Tiberias of Galilee, right? So the, the sea had various names, but notice that Luke specifically calls it the lake. Right. So Luke is a Gentile. He's using the name that would have been used by everybody at the time. Uh, and he uses that phrase consistently. He never uses the term C. So Luke 8 has the lake uh, several times. Um, uh, so what's going on here? Well, uh, one thing that uh, in fact, let me let me stop for a moment. Stop sharing my screen to make sure I'm, I'm still being followed. Uh, and by the way, thank you, uh, Uriah Smith. Oh, I didn't stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Uriah Smith. Uh, so Uriah Smith says, what book out there talks about the new Exodus theme? The, one of the best books to get is a book by Dr. Michael Morales, uh, I think it's called Exodus Old and New. Uh, Michael Morales was actually a professor of mine at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He has incredibly good books. One of my favorite books was a book that he wrote on the book of Leviticus, where he also talks about the new Exodus issue. Uh, but more recently, he wrote a book called Exodus Old and New. So that's the book that I would recommend. Um, but thank you also, Siddhartha, for that, uh, and bless you as well. Uh, and let me thank, by the way, my Patreon supporters and everybody who supports me on PayPal. Uh, I'm blown away by your help. It, it really does help. Uh, in fact, the good, good news here real quick before getting back to the topic, good news is, uh, as many of you know, I have many jobs. My hope has been to be able to do more stuff on YouTube, more lessons, more debates, and so forth. And one of the things that meant was that I needed to be able to scale back from some of my jobs. And uh, because of people supporting, uh, you know, I, I'm able to scale back on some of that. 
you know, I'm always going to have my day job. I serve as a pastor to prisoners. Um, so that's always going to be, uh, you know, uh, something that I do. But, uh, you know, having two or three jobs, uh, I also work in the evening. Uh, I have worked in the evening uh, for a ministry answering theological questions for people uh, that write into the ministry. Uh, and I also, you know, preach at churches on Sundays, uh, filling in for pastors, so I have to prepare sermons. So I, I'm usually pretty busy, and in order to do more YouTube stuff and benefit all of you, I needed to be able to scale back from some of that. The good news is that I'm now able to, uh, uh, I, I've changed my night job, and I'm only going to be working now some of the daytime hours. Uh, I, I switched, I, I'm going to be working uh, daytime hours for that job and uh, have I'll have more time for stuff in the evening. So thank you so much to the Patreon supporters and to the PayPal supporters. Also, all of that has helped me to, like I said, recently uh, I was having the internet connection issue here and because people are helpful uh, and supporting, I've been a, I was able to get something that hopefully is now uh, giving you a better uh, quality uh, reception. All right, so what is it that's going on when Mark consistently refers to it as the Sea of Galilee? Now, one of the things that, you know, to me, when, when some people are so hyper-skeptical, and, you know, we ought to be skeptical of, of skepticism too, right? <laughs> I mean, it always amazes me how people uh, are, are, you know, it's not that there's something problematic with having a measure of skepticism and wanting to question things and wanting to know the answers to things, but there's a point where skepticism becomes absurd, right? If, if, uh, people are so skeptical that, uh, you know, uh, they, they can't even, I, I mean that they, uh, well, that that things that would or, ordinarily not be problematic to them suddenly become problematic. I mean, that's a problem, right? Um, it, when you when you think about, you know, Mark is a first century figure, right? Mark lived in Israel. I, I already did several episodes proving that Mark was the author of this gospel. Mark was a native of Jerusalem, Israel. I mean, he was an Israelite, right? The idea that he didn't know the difference between uh, the body of water in uh, in Galilee and whether it was a sea in the sense that it was a salt water, you know, that, that, that it was a salt water body or a freshwater lake uh, automatically or, uh, you know, it ought to suggest to you. I mean, this is just stretching it a bit. I mean, it's uh it, it's better to ask what might Mark be doing here. Right? Uh, why would Mark use this term C? Well, what I'm suggesting to you is that Mark is deliberately using the term C, which, by the way, the word yam in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it refers to yam kenesaret, which refers to the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. That term means C in Hebrew. So uh, if somebody wanted to be, you know, wanted to push this a bit, it, it's already used in the Old Testament in that way. Right? So Mark's not doing something here that he doesn't already have precedent for in the Old Testament, but he is doing something that would be, have been uncharacteristic for somebody in his time. And so the question that somebody ought to be asking is, why would Mark be doing this? What is it that Mark is trying to make people think about? Okay? And what I'm suggesting to you is that Mark is, is trying to get you to think about this Old Testament motif of God as the divine warrior who rescues his people from the sea, okay? And moreover, in the Old Testament, the sea is presented as a source of uh, chaos, of disorder, of, of trouble, of destruction, and in fact, as the, uh, uh, if you will, the abode of what's called in the Old Testament, and I'll show you passages for this, the dragon, okay, or Leviathan, right? A seven-headed beast. Okay. Now what's, what's that all about? I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but, uh, 
one thing to to think about, in fact, uh, you guys are all familiar with this. I know that you know some of you may not have seen this in the Old Testament, and I'll show you passages on that. But the book of Revelation does this as well, doesn't it? In fact, let me show you a passage where it, it uses this idea um, to talk about Satan. Okay, I know you all know this, but uh, in, in uh, this context, people are often not, uh, they often don't connect these dots. So here's Revelation 12, and it says, in apocalyptic language, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and her on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, who is this woman, and who is this child that it's being spoken of here? Well, the imagery is derived from the Old Testament, right? When you have reference to the sun, the moon, and 12 stars, that goes back to Joseph's vision, where he saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. Why 11 stars? Because he's the 12 stars, right? This was a picture of Israel. It referred to his mother, father, and then the, uh, his 12 brothers, or his 11 brothers. So this picture that's being presented here, this woman clothed with the sun and the moon and a, a crown of 12 stars on her head, it's a picture of Israel, and the child that's being uh, born then is a reference to the Messiah. But then notice what it says. Now, the heading here is not inspired, but it's accurate, isn't it? It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, who is the dragon? Right? It should be obvious. As you go down in the context, notice that it says the dragon and his angels waged war, right? And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So Satan is presented in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. I know we haven't looked at verses for that yet but in both Testaments is presented as a serpent, a dragon, right? Um, so what that quote from Dempsey is getting at, let's go back to Dempsey's quote here. Uh, uh, let's see Dempsey's quote here again. Oh man, I went through a lot of slides. <laughs> um, he says, Mark portrays Jesus as the eschatological divine warrior who repeats Yahweh's primordial acts of battling the evil forces of chaos, sea, and dragon. Okay, so what I'm pointing out to you is that Mark is deliberately using this term sea as one of the ways that he's drawing your attention to Jesus as the divine warrior. He's the one who has power over the sea uh, the source of destruction and chaos, uh, and the abode, if you will, of the dragon. Okay? Now, uh, have you ever wondered why um, immediately after Jesus' baptism, where Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, we're told that the Spirit impels Jesus right, to go out and do and what? What is it that he's impelled to do? Uh, he, he's sent out to be tested or tempted by Satan, right? So immediately after Jesus' baptism in the water, he's driven out and tempted by Satan. And repeatedly we see Jesus uh, doing battle with Satan's minions. Now, we're not yet looking at uh, verses uh, 13 and 14. Um, oh, so Binet says the dragon seems a lot like Rome in Revelation 17. Now, uh, one thing I'll say without getting into the whole issue of uh, who that refers to is when it, it's very interesting, the Old Testament, when it talks about uh, Leviathan or these other evil forces like Rahab 
or uh, the Tanin. There are other terms that are used to refer to these evil entities. Sometimes it's referring to political entities. Sometimes it's referring to the evil entities behind them, right? That's why you have passages like Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where sometimes people are saying, is this referring to a political ruler like the king of Babylon or the king of Tyre, or is it referring to a evil entity in back of them? Well, it's both, right? Because, uh, you know, Satan is, is acting through these evil empires. These evil empires are, that's why you have, uh, for example, in the book of Daniel, Daniel presents these evil empires that rise up against God's people to destroy them. He describes them as ravenous beasts, right? But he, he describes them, uh, or like the book of Revelation talks about a beast coming up out of the sea, right? So it's, it's referring in, in one sense to the evil agent behind, but also to the, the face of that evil entity uh, you know, the, the political power that's being animated by it, right? So whatever the specific political identity of the beast in, in Revelation 17, and I, I'm only not getting into that because I don't want to be distracted by it. It is a political entity there, but in Revelation 12, it's very clear that it's a reference to Satan, right? Because it explicitly says that it's referring to Satan. Um, but, uh, in, in Mark chapter 1, you have John the Baptist coming. He identifies Jesus as the strong one. Then he baptizes Jesus. And then Jesus is driven out into the wilderness where he is confronted by Satan. In fact, Mark uniquely says that Jesus was in the wilderness with the wild beasts. Why does Mark make reference to that? Well, I'm going to hold off on that, but I, I want you to get a flavor for some of this. Mark is drawing on this Old Testament uh, stuff, right? In the Old Testament, Satan is portrayed as a dragon, a serpent, a snake, as the enemy of God's people. He's associated with the, the sea, and God, when he delivers his people, is not only delivering them through the sea and from the sea, but also from Satan uh, and those that Satan is using. Remember that when God was doing battle with Egypt, destroying Pharaoh and his armies, uh, he was also at the same time doing battle against the objects of Egypt's worship. Who were the objects of Egypt's worship? Now, in one sense, they were idols. But in another sense, as scripture also tells us, back of those idols were demons. Deuteronomy 32 tells us that back of the idolatrous objects of pagan worship are demons. 1 Corinthians tell, tw 10 tells us that the, uh, the entities behind pagan idolatry are demons. Okay, So when God is doing battle with Pharaoh and his... In fact, uh, Rahab is one of the names for one of these, these evil entities in the Old Testament. But Rahab is also used as a name for Egypt. It literally means worthless one, but uh, it's used to refer both to Egypt and to a serpentine or dragon-like uh, creature. Okay, so what is why is all of this relevant to what John the Baptist says about Jesus as the strong one? Okay, well let's let's look at a bunch of Old Testament stuff here that will hopefully fill in the picture for you. All right, so we got to move past all this stuff about Satan and the sea. Actually, I didn't show you. Actually, let me show you this. Um, so in Mark 1, he makes reference to Jesus as the stronger one. Okay, he uses the word iskirotoros, which is an adjective, means stronger. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm only pointing out that it's an adjective because... I'm going to show you other instances where uh, a different form of the same word is being used, basically. right? This is adjectival, but elsewhere we're going to get a noun and so forth. But it's, it's the same, uh, it's, it's just a different form of the same idea. Um, but here's Exodus 15, verses 1 through 4. 
obviously a song celebrating God's deliverance of his people at the sea. It says, then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a man of war. Okay, Yahweh ish milchama. Okay, it literally says Yahweh is a man of war. Okay, pretty significant, right? Um, you know, it, it's it's not just saying that God is a warrior, which is uh, the, the main emphasis that I want to make. But it specifically calls him a man of war in his coming to deliver Israel, right? So at the redemption of Israel from Egypt, God is presented as a man of war. In fact, um, it's interesting in the Talmud, when the post Christian rabbis are battling against the earlier Jewish idea of more than one divine person. Okay, and we've talked about this before. Second Temple Jews believe there was more than one divine person in the Godhead. One of the classic texts that earlier Jews based this idea on is Daniel 7, where it talks about the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. And so sometimes these uh, pre-Rabbinic Jewish sources will refer to... Uh, these two figures as uh, the sort of like uh, the older uh, older Yahweh, junior Yahweh, or not older, but um, uh, they use the term Gadol, which means uh, uh, seen. You might put it like this: senior and junior Yahweh. Okay, is is uh, kind of how they put it. Okay, there's there may be a better way of putting that, but. They, they, they thought of these two persons in Daniel 7 as two divine persons. And when they looked back at the Exodus, Exodus 15, they said this was the second Yahweh, right? The second person who is being portrayed as Yahweh. And they said he's... Uh, uh, so when the Talmud is trying to refer to this, they try to answer these earlier Jews by saying... Um, uh, well, how do I put this? <laughs> the So the, the earlier Jews said that at the time of the Exodus, God appears as a young warrior. At the time of the giving of the law, he appears as an old man or as the ancient of days. And so these earlier Jews saw these as these two figures from Daniel 7, right? At the time of the Exodus, it's, it's the junior Yahweh who's delivering the people. And at, at Sinai, the one who's revealing the law to the people the law, right, presented as a as a lawgiver. He's presented as an uh, as Yahweh senior, if you will. I don't necessarily like that language, but you can see how this easily maps onto the New Testament descriptions of the Father and the Son, right? Two persons who are identified as Yahweh, one of whom is the Father, one of whom is the Son. Um, but uh, anyways, in any case, in Exodus 15, 1, God is called a man of war. But notice also in this context, that it says, the Lord is my strength, Azi. Notice the word strength there. Okay, This idea of God as strong and as the source of his people's strength, it comes up over and over again in the Old Testament, often in context where God is being presented as a warrior. Okay, uh, Here's another example. This comes from Isaiah 40, which remember, this is the New Exodus section a section that Mark quoted at the beginning of his gospel. Okay, Mark cites Isaiah 40, verse 3. This comes from verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with might or strength. Okay, And in the LXX, it uses the word iskuos, which I said is, is a form of the word or related to the word iskurateros. Behold, the Lord, the Lord, he comes with strength. Okay, Even the arm with dominion. Later in Isaiah 42, 13, still in this new Exodus section, it says the Lord will go out like a warrior. Notice it again. Uh, it's the word uh, kegabor. Uh, ka is the um, uh, 
uh, how do you, uh, uh, it's a preposition that's attached to a word and it means like or as. So it says, the Lord will go out ka gibor. Gibor is the word for warrior or man of war. Okay. The Lord will go out like a warrior. He will stir his zeal like a man of war. Oops. He will shout. Indeed, he will raise a war cry. He'll prevail against his enemies. In the LXX, it says he shall yell against his enemies with strength. Ischios. Okay. Here in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 29 and 31, it says he gives strength to the weary and to the one who lacks strength, he increases power. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Again, God is being presented as strong and as the source of strength for his people. The Septuagint uses the word uh, uh, ischios, uh, a form of the word. Uh, it says he is giving strength to the hungering ones, but the ones waiting upon God shall change in strength. Uh, later in Isaiah 41, 10, it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. Um, uh, oh, I'm thinking, why, why did I have this on my slides? Well, obviously, because it uses the word uh, strengthen, right? In the LXX, it's a form of the word uh, eskios, um, and it means, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, it's the one strengthening you as I have there in, uh, parenthetically. Um, so it's, it's, um, a participle, uh, but it's being used, uh, substantively, meaning it's, it's being used as functioning as a noun, the one strengthening you. Okay. So God is called the one strengthening you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 42, 13, I already quoted that. I guess I have it duplicated here. Uh, maybe I didn't draw attention. Oh, wait. Actually, I didn't want that. Here is Job 16. It says, I was at ease, but he... So I, I've shown you that this idea is associated with the Exodus and the New Test uh, and the a New Exodus, but it's also found elsewhere in the Old Testament, this notion of God as a warrior. Job 16 says, I was at ease, but he shattered me and he... Uh, has grasped me by the neck and shaken me to pieces. He has also set me up as his target. His arrows surround me without mercy. He splits my kidneys open. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks through me with breach after breach. He runs at me like a warrior. So notice it refers to God's arrows. And then it says he runs at me like a warrior. Cut Gibor. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah 20 says, The Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Uh, and the word, uh, uh, well, the word for it's, uh, Gevora reads, uh, so you have the word Gevora again, right? Which means warrior, uh, and Aritz, which means, uh, dread, dreadful or awesome, right? So he's called, uh, Kegebor Aritz, right? Like a dread warrior. So notice this language, right? Gebor, uh, Eskew on uh, the idea for strength. All these terms are being used for God to identify him as a strong warrior, a man of war. And all of these things are associated with God, especially at the Exodus and in relation to the new Exodus. Uh, but it also presents God as a warrior whenever he's engaged in uh, some kind of uh, battle or confrontation especially with his enemies and the enemies of his people. Now, let me stop here for a moment because I want to ask you guys a question. You all have actually heard the word Gibor before. I'm pretty confident, or at least most of you have. Can you guys think of another place where the word Gibor is used? Maybe you guys have already commented in the chat section because the word sounded familiar to you. But where have you guys heard the word Gibor? Jeremy Wong gets the prize. Isaiah 9, 6, right? In Isaiah 9, 6, the Messiah, what does it say about the Messiah? In, in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, this is the name by which he will be called, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor. Right, So it uses the term for mighty warrior or man of war coupled with, conjoined with the word for God. He's called El Gibor, the mighty God. Okay, 
He's also referred to as Gibor or the Mighty One in another psalm that you should all know well. This is Psalm 45. Um, it says, Gird your sword on your thigh, O Mighty One, Gibor. Right? In your splendor, in your majesty, and in your majesty, ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The people fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. How is the Messiah being portrayed here? He's being portrayed as the strong one, a mighty one, the same way God is described in the Old Testament. He's clearly being portrayed here as a warrior. Ride on victoriously, it says. And then the psalm goes on to say, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So the coming Messiah is identified, even in the Old Testament, as the divine warrior. In Isaiah 9, 6, and in Psalm 45, verses 3 uh, through 7. All right. Um. I guess uh, I'll run through a few more things real quickly before taking a pause to take some of your questions. This idea of God as a warrior is also found, uh, it's, it's indicated in other ways. God is called the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies, times without number in the Old Testament. In fact, I couldn't even fit all the times uh, on, the, uh, on the slide, so I just said et alia, which means and others. Um, but here are some examples. In 1 Samuel 4, 4, uh, it says it refers to God as the Lord of hosts, but notice it says the so the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who sits above the cherubim. Okay, so the the Ark of the Covenant is portrayed as God's throne, and he's in this context where it's referring to the the Ark of the Covenant. And to, the, to God is seated between the cherubim on the ark. Uh, th this context of, of God being portrayed as the Lord of hosts, he's, he's portrayed as being seated on a throne. Well, repeatedly in the Old Testament, the Israelites are told to carry this ark, God's throne, with them into battle. Okay? So this is a way of saying that God is going into battle with them. And ultimately, that he is the deciding factor in the battle. In some cases, God says that he's fighting with them. In other cases, he says that he's fighting for them. Right. So you have both ideas. Either God is, is viewed as strengthening the people so that they might fight his battles, or he's viewed as the one who is unilaterally engaging in battle on behalf of his people. Uh, so, for example... Um, this is 1 Samuel 17. It says, Then uh, David said to the Philistines, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I'll strike you down and remove your head from you, and I'll give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Uh, in First Chronicles 14, it says, The Philistines made yet another raid in the valley. David inquired again of God, and God said to him, You shall not go up after them, circle around behind them, and come at them in front of the balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall go out to battle, for God will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. Now, this text is, uh, I, mean, I love this text because uh, notice what it's saying. It's, it's saying that just like the armies of Israel are to go out, it says, when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall go out to battle. The, the picture that's being presented is just like Israel's armies are going out to engage the fight, so the armies of the Lord, the Lord and his armies, his heavenly hosts, are going out to fight with them, and which also means that they are engaging behind the scenes the forces of evil. 
right? Um, and so uh, you, you actually have, I think I have quotes here coming up, um, very interesting in both Josephus and Tacitus when, it, it, when, he, when they talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, well, let me just quote Josephus, okay? Remember that Jesus said in numerous places in the Gospels, because they rejected him, in Luke 19, Jesus says that they were going to be destroyed because they didn't recognize the time of their visitation. Okay, that's Luke 19. God is going to destroy them because they didn't recognize the time of their visitation. Well, if you look at the parables that Jesus tells in Matthew 21, Matthew 22, Matthew, I mean, all the way leading up to the Olivet Discourse where he prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem, you'll see not only these parables where Jesus is talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem, but he also speaks of the fact that God is going to send forth armies against Israel. But Jesus also presents this as something that he himself is going to be involved in, right? Remember what Jesus said to the high priest? Now, I know a lot of people read this a different way, but it's really unavoidable when you pay attention to the grammar. But at his trial in Mark 14, this is exactly what Jesus was threatening against the Sanhedrin. Okay, Jesus, uh, the high priest says to Jesus, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Okay, this is another indication that son of God is a divine title in Mark. Jesus said, I am, and you'll see the son of man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Okay, notice he says, you, he switches from the singular, in fact, He's, uh, well, he's talking to the high priest. The high priest asks him, and Jesus says, you, meaning you all, he's talking to the Sanhedrin, you all will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's saying they're going to see this. They are going to be witnesses to the fact that the Son of Man has been exalted, and most ominously, they're going to witness his coming against them. Okay. Well, listen to what Josephus tells us about the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I, I have a bunch of oh, um, I have a bunch of other quotes before that. But here's Josephus in Jewish War. This is uh, Book Six, Chapter Five, Second uh, Section Three. He says, besides these portentous signs, that's my uh, parenthetical statement because I can't give you the full context. Josephus in context is talking about a bunch of signs that happened before Jerusalem's destructions. He says, besides these, all these other signs, a few days after that feast, on the one and 20th day of the month Artemisius, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomena appeared. I supposed the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Okay, what Josephus is describing here sounds very much like what we read in that Old Testament passage where it speaks about the sound of the uh, uh, of footsteps in the uh, uh, at the top of the balsam trees. Josephus is saying, this sounds incredible, but this is what the people that witnessed it recounted. They recounted that before the setting of the sun, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Now notice what Tacitus says. Okay, so not only Josephus, who was... Uh, Josephus, by the way, for those that don't know, he was a native of Galilee. So he's from Israel. He came from the same part of the world that Jesus grew up in. He was captured by the Romans when they went against Galilee prior to eventually sacking Jerusalem. So Josephus was now uh, in the, uh, he, he was now, um, you know, under the yoke, if you will, of Rome. And he wrote his history now. Uh, under their domination. Okay, but here's Tacitus, a Roman historian. 
listen to what he says. This is in his history. It says, Prod prodigies had occurred, which this nation, meaning Israel, prone to superstition, but hating all religious rites, did not deem it lawful to expiate by offering and sacrifice. In other words, he's saying there were all these omens showing that they were in trouble, but Israel didn't try to expiate the offended gods by offering sacrifices to them. So they didn't pay attention to the omens, is what Tacitus is saying. But then he goes on, there had been seen hosts joining battle in the skies, the fiery gleam of arms, the temple illuminated by a sudden radiance from the clouds. The doors of the inner shrine, meaning the temple in Jerusalem, were suddenly thrown open and a voice of more than mortal tone was heard to cry that the gods were departing. At the same uh, instant, there was a mighty stir as of departure. Now, Tacitus is a pagan, and so we could expect to, him to cast these things in pagan terms. Uh, but, but Tacitus is saying that, and Josephus, by the way, mentions uh, the opening of the doors as well. And uh, what, when, when Josephus recounts the words that were spoken from the temple, the superhuman voice that was uttered, that was heard when the doors of the temple, which the, the doors were massive, right? They don't just open on their own. It wasn't like, you know, some modern hotel where you, you've got these, uh, you know, automatic doors. These doors didn't just open by themselves. These, uh, uh, so these doors open and, and Josephus says that a voice was heard saying, let us depart. Okay, so a voice from the temple says, let us depart. All of this preceded Jerusalem's destruction and portended its destruction, pointed to the fact that it was about to be destroyed. And all of this is uh, spoken about by the Lord Jesus. In fact, if you read uh, Eusebius, who is the father of church history, he tells us that the early Christians escaped Jerusalem before these events happened because they were warned about these things prophetically. Okay, so the early Christians knew to get out of Jerusalem when they saw certain signs that were coming to pass, and so they fled Jerusalem to uh, Petra. Um, now, uh, there's another statement in Josephus that I actually have to mention. It's one of my favorites. Um, in uh, I think it's also in book six. I'm going from memory here, but one of the things that the Romans did was they had these, uh, they were masters at war, right? Uh, no wonder Daniel describes it as the most fearsome beast that he had seen. Uh, but Rome, uh, one of their weapons of war was their catapults, which were able to hurl 100 pound stones, right? And, Josephus, in his description of these, uh, and by the way, they were called scorpions, right? Because their tail would uh, hurl these things, and so it was like a, torp a scorpion sting. But the stones were 100 pounds, and they were white. And so he, uh, Josephus tells us that when they would go through the sky, they would reflect the light of the sun so that when people saw them, they had this brilliant appearance to them. And they made this uh, hurling, whistling noise as they were hurled through the air. And so Josephus says in book six, when the first stone was shot from the catapults, the watchmen on the wall started crying out, warning the people. And here's what they said. They said, as they saw this brilliant light hurling through the air, they said, the sun is coming. The sun is coming. It's S-O-N in Josephus. Not S-U-N, it's S-O-N, right? Uh, maybe I'll come uh, next time and I'll have that quote for you. But again, it's in book six if anybody wants to look for it. So uh, some of this was sort of a, a tangent because I was reading these, um, uh, these other passages that reminded me of it. But, but the whole upshot of this is that God in the Old Testament is presented as a warrior who does battle with uh, his enemies and the enemies of his people, which include not merely flesh and blood, 
but ultimately back of them principalities and powers and so forth right that's why the new testament says that our war is ultimately against them thank you so much uh ty i think that's uh how you say your your name or maybe those are just initials t-y-h um uh, Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so is everybody tracking me here so far uh, on, on what I'm talking about? God is portrayed as a warrior, as a man of war, particularly in the deliverance of his people from Egypt, from the uh, at the Exodus, and especially in the New Exodus. In these contexts, God is uh, described as strong, as the strong one, as the one who is stronger than his enemies and his people's enemies. Right, as strong as his enemies are and their enemies are, he is stronger. Okay, that's how John the Baptist describes Jesus. Right, he refers to Jesus as the stronger one. After me, one is coming who is stronger than I am. And then immediately, Jesus is portrayed after his baptism in a confrontation with Satan, the dragon. In fact, do you remember what it says in Mark 3? In Mark chapter 3, when Jesus, doing battle with Satan's forces, overturning, overtoppling, routing them, muzzling them, you know, delivering uh, people from them, the, the, the religious leaders object, and they say that Jesus is casting out Satan, or he's casting out demons by Satan. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say in response to this? First of all, he calls Satan a strong man, doesn't he? He calls Satan a strong man, but he identifies himself as the one who is stronger than Satan. Okay, in fact, um, I'll pull that up for you so you can see it. We'll go to Mark 3. All right. Oh, here we go. Mark 3, it says, He came home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he's possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house. Oops the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. And then Jesus gets into the whole issue of the uh, blasphemy of the spirit. Okay. So Jesus in Mark one by John is portrayed as the stronger one. And in uh, the later context, he's portrayed as stronger than Satan, the ultimate enemy of God's people. All right. So before I continue with uh, some of this, um, does anybody have any questions related to this? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was waiting for you guys to ask questions. I was reading something. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so Zara says, does this notion of C as chaos carry over to Genesis 1? Okay, so there, there's a lot more for me to say regarding this whole notion of chaos comp. Some scholars go in some directions I wouldn't. Um, uh, but I, I would say this. Um, in, in Genesis 1, you have this notion of the world being submerged, right? It's shrouded in water. It speaks of the spirit of God uh, brooding over the surface of the deep, right? And then later you have God uh, ca causing the waters to part and the dry land to emerge. There's no suggestion in Genesis that any of this is out from under the control of God and God somehow needs to get it under control, right? By the way, the word chaos comp means, um, literally it's from German, means struggle against chaos. But but you do have, like, in, well, so in these ancient Near Eastern myths, you have all this notion of the sea as a god and the uh, some other god is presented as doing battle with it, like Baal or uh, Marduk or what have you. Um and, and some people will try and uh, push this notion back into the creation account, even though in some of these other ancient Near Eastern contexts, it's not talking about creation, right? You, you, have different, you have different ancient Near Eastern discussions of uh, the gods and uh, battle with uh, evil enemies like uh, associated with the sea and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's obvious that when you look at Genesis 1, that if there's any idea of any of this in the background, Genesis is engaging in a polemic against that. The sea is not presented as something that God needs to gain mastery over, right? God is presented as creating everything, including the sea. However, even in Genesis 1, the sea is an impediment to man who is a land-dwelling creature, right? The sea, the sea has to be parted. Dry land has to emerge in order for man, who is a land creature, to dwell on it. And so the uh, when Genesis describes God creating heaven and earth, it says that the earth was without form and void. So it's uninhabited, it's a desolate place, and it's uninhabitable until God does the successive acts uh, making it a fit habitation for man. Later, when the fall occurs, and you now have uh, evil introduced into creation, uh, now evil becomes associated with some of these domains, right? And so, when God pours out judgment, uh, he also does. He often does so by unleashing uh, the the sea, if you will. Uh, so he, he he removes the boundaries of the sea, like at the flood. Um, or uh, in the case of uh, Egypt, right, he drowns the Egyptian armies in the sea, but for Israel, the waters are parted again so that they can cross over. In all of this, you see God is, you know, uh, uh, stronger than uh, the sea, uh, but there's never any sense of, um, you know, the sea being out from under the control of God, uh, or anything like that. It's God's powerful word that parts the waters and so forth. But I would say that after after the Genesis creation account, you do now have introduced this notion of, of evil. You know, uh, well, I won't go into that. There was something else I was going to go into, but it would take too long. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's no relevance, but... I, I wouldn't agree with the direction that some people take that look at some of these ancient Near Eastern things and, and read some of that back into the Old Testament. I, I hope that was an answer uh, the, to what you were asking. Um, um, let me see. Okay, so let me, let me just read your question again because I want to make sure I answered that. Uh, does this idea of sea as chaos carry over to Genesis 1? Okay, so there's no sense in which the sea is somehow uh, this unruly thing that God needs to tame, but there is this notion that the sea is an impediment to 
God's goal of creating man. And so God needs to part the waters, cause the dry land to appear. Later in the Bible, once evil is introduced into the creation, uh, the sea becomes uh, either a, a tool that God uses for judgment or it's described in some way uh, as this tumultuous thing that's associated with evil forces and, and uh, the dragon, uh, Leviathan, and so forth. In fact, I never showed you any passages on that, did you? Um, well, maybe I'll do that after I answer some questions or next time. Um, so let's see, any other questions here? Um, any other questions, folks? No questions? <laughs> right. Slam says, uh, Psalm 104, he sets boundary for the waters. Now, if I'm not mistaken, and this also is relevant to all of this, in Psalm 104, and certainly in other Psalms, God is portrayed as muzzling the sea, right? Muzzling it, saying, be quiet or be still. That's the same thing Jesus does in the New Testament. He literally says to the sea, be muzzled. This is the same language that Jesus uses when he confronts the demons. Be muzzled, right? So you have this association in Mark's gospel between demons and the sea, and you also have uh, uh, that idea in the Old Testament, this idea of God muzzling the sea. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Jack races. The Bible makes a point that the sea is just another part of creation. So I hope nobody would misunderstand me. And I'm not saying Jack did, but I, I do want to underscore it since Jack made this comment. The sea is never presented as something out from under the control of God. Satan, his minions, everything is subject to God's sovereignty. However, Satan is morally in rebellion against God, as are his minions. And so there is this ethical sense. There's this rebellion. And God had he chosen to do so, could have put down that rebellion immediately. However, God in his patience for purposes that he explains throughout scripture has not chosen to end all of it uh, immediately, uh, but in the way that he's chosen to do so. Uh, one, you know, we should rejoice in that. You know, if, if God wanted to simply put down all evil in opposition to himself, he could have done that as soon as Adam and Eve sinned. He could have wiped out, uh, you know, all rational creatures. He could have started over. Uh, right, He didn't have to do any of this, but he did. And so there is this sense in which even though uh, God is sovereign over everything, Satan is in moral rebellion against him. And uh, you know, God is portrayed as doing battle against Satan and his forces. And uh, Jesus is ultimately presented in this way. But the battle that Jesus is engaged in is ultimately going to turn out to be, as we're going to see in Mark's gospel, not merely one of, of mere power, right, where he's uh, exerting his power to drive out Satan or drive him off, but he's ultimately going to defeat Satan and undo everything that he has introduced uh, into creation by virtue of his work on the cross. It's ultimately at the cross that Jesus is going to defeat Satan, right? That's why Paul can say in Colossians 2 that it was at the cross that Jesus disarmed evil powers and made a public spectacle of them, right? So it's ultimately at the cross that Jesus does battle with the forces of evil and destroys them uh, or ultimately undermines. Uh, so um, Faith Over Fear says, what verse says that, all of creation will sing praises to him. Sorry to be off topic. Um, well, that's fine. Uh, I'm not getting a lot of questions on this particular topic, so um, I'm happy to uh, oblige. Here's Psalm 150 as one example. Um All right, so let me, oops, sorry about that. Um, here's Psalm 150. It says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. 
praise him in his mighty expanse, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with harp, lyre, trimble, all that kind of stuff. So uh, here you have a statement about praising God in his sanctuary, praising God in his mighty expanse. But if you go back, um, uh, oh, wait a minute, I think... I think I'm in the wrong psalm. It's it's right around the end here. Hold on. How am I missing it? Um, yeah, so that's... I'm getting there, folks. I'm getting there. It might be... I knew it was going to be the one psalm that I, I'm not turning to. I'm... I'm thinking it's, uh, oh, here it is. I knew it was in the last five. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him. That's why I was thrown off because you have that similar language to Psalm 150. Praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all stars of light, praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also established them forever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountain and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples. Over and over again, right? It, it, it mentions praising the Lord, everything praising the Lord. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Okay, so it is Psalm 148. Psalm 148. Um, oh, so TJ Hornady was uh, happy that I didn't have an immediate answer. <laughs> well, I wasn't happy with myself for not having an immediate answer. I was thinking, you know, it was Psalm 150, and I, I think it's just because of that similar language. But anyways, Psalm 148. Now I'll never forget it, Lord willing. All right. So Air K says, hey, Anthony, great study, brother. Was just curious. Have you engaged with Robert Alter's work on the Old Testament? If so, what are your thoughts? Generally speaking, should Christians engage with it? Thanks. So, um, I, I haven't read it. I haven't read Alter himself. I've read some quotes and stuff from Alter. So I, I couldn't give you, I, so I can't say yes to that. And because I can't, I, I wouldn't want to give you my assessment of Alter. Um, but I, um, I'm trying to think if I even have the name comes up so often that I think it's probably a shame that I haven't read anything by Alter. Am I still sharing my screen? So I'm sorry. I have to say, I don't know to that. Um, sorry. I can't say I've read it, but I'm trying to remember even if I've, heard so so i've you know i obviously read scholars i like i read scholars i dislike my concern here is that i'm not sure if i've read people quoting him favorably uh so i couldn't even tell you what scholars i do find to be competent and reputable say about him so i'm just going to hold off and say i don't know um so Arabian Prince says, any upcoming major debates? Uh, so yeah, August 21st, I have two debates with Shabir Ali. Again, uh, this will be my fifth and sixth debates with Shabir. Uh, we're going to be debating salvation in Christianity, salvation in Islam. So those will be two interesting debates. Uh, they're going to be relatively short debates. I think about an hour and 15 minutes long, which is fine. It gives you a bite-sized uh, thing to chew off there. But I'm trying to get a debate with Jake, the Muslim metaphysician. Here's the interesting thing about this. So Jake, without alerting me, he posted a video a while back after my discussion with Uthman Ibn Farouk, where Ibn Farouk kept saying, I'm not a debater, I'm not a debater. Right. So, so Uthman doesn't want to do a formal debate. 
So Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, went on his channel and started, you know, talking about some of the discussion, which I didn't even really get to finish with Uthman. And, you know, Uthman didn't for the life of him know what I was talking about. That's why I want to engage him in a formal debate. And it was apparent to me from Jake's comments that he didn't know what I was getting at either. And so I was thinking, uh, when I'm listening to this, you know, he wants, I know he styles himself as a philosopher and thinks he's prepared for that. Uh, but anyways, he, he goes on his show and he said he, uh, he's challenging me to debate, but he never sent it to me, right? What, what, would, what reason would there be for him to think that I watch his channel? right? He didn't do anything to send that to me. So I didn't know it existed. I'm suddenly getting these messages from Muslims saying, why are you running from the Muslim metaphysician? And I'm thinking running from the Muslim metaphysician. I don't even know who that guy is. Right? So then I'm contacted by a Christian who said, will you debate him? And I said, absolutely set it up. And then the Muslim metaphysicians over there saying, you know, I, I don't want to do it on a Christian channel or his channel or whatever. So he's got that qualification, right? You can't do it because of that reason. Uh, then he says, oh, uh, I can't debate right now. I'm very busy. What does he do? He turns around and he has a debate with James White, who has no background in philosophy. Okay, I'm not saying anything about how James White did in that debate. I didn't hear the debate. The only thing I heard, I listened to uh, Jake's opening statement, okay? So I don't know how well James White did or didn't do, okay? I just know that philosophy is not his expertise. It's not his strength. That's where Jake thinks is, you know, his, his strength. And so he wants to debate these things from a philosophical angle. Okay, so, uh, you know, most people don't know this, but, you know, I talk more about the Bible. I love the Bible. Uh, I love biblical theology, systematic theology. I love apologetics and all the rest. But I, I have an extensive background in philosophical writing and philosophical works. Okay, I, I do take the classical Christian approach that theology is the queen of the sciences and philosophy is a handmaiden to theology. Okay, In other words, I don't believe that philosophy dictates anything to scripture. Right, philosophy doesn't tell scripture what's true. It doesn't tell us what scripture. I I don't want to give you a whole lecture here on philosophy right now, uh, but I take the the basic approach um, that has been a, a there's a long history of this in the Christian Church uh, that uh, you know th there are some people who say that we uh, we reason in order to believe. There are others who say we believe in order to understand. Uh, that latter approach was more the approach of Anselm, who says that we begin with God's revelation to us, and then we reason from that. So philosophy is subordinate to theology, and it's used as a tool. It's not a lord or a master of God's revelation. So it can't dictate to Scripture what's true and that sort of thing. But anyways, uh, not to get into all of that. That's a, a subject for another time. But uh, I'm thinking... I'd love to debate Jake. He's challenged me. Now I'm talking to him and he's got all these qualifications. It's got to be on this channel or that channel. Uh, and I don't care. I've said I'll do it on anybody's channel. I'll go on SC Dawa, uh, SC Dudu. I'll go on Muhammad Hijab's channel. Uh, you know, you, you name it, I'll come. If they cut me off, hey, I've got my own YouTube page to address them. I don't care. So um, I've said I'll do it anywhere. And all of this is taking place through a mediator, right? Somebody else is co corresponding with him and corresponding with me. Then, uh, you know, so he tells me, then he says uh, he's too busy until the end of the year. I think fine, no big deal. But he's had a debate now with James White. Now I know that he's uh, uh, recently set up a debate with Samuel Green, right? I love Samuel Green to pieces. Um, but I'm thinking to myself, why is this guy who wants to argue philosophically trying to engage people that he doesn't have any reason to think have a philosophical background, right? Uh, and, and again, uh, don't misunderstand that. I, I'm, this is, I didn't hear James White in that debate, okay? And I don't even know what Samuel Green's going to say in his upcoming debate. Uh, praise the Lord for Samuel Green, love Samuel Green. 
my my comment here has to do with what looks to me suspicious with respect to Jake Brancatella. That's his last name. Which, by the way, he's Italian. Kind of kind of grates on me. I don't know if he's Sicilian, but he does say he's Italian. Brancatella is Italian. Okay, my background Sicilian. So, um, but uh, you know, Jake. That's his angle. He doesn't want to really. Uh, anyways, so. Uh, I do hope that we're going to be having a debate, but at this point, it seems like it, it seems like there's a lot of beating around the bush. And I really hate the one thing I hate uh, is what I call pre-debate debates. I don't like all the stuff, all the back and forth that goes on before the debates, right? Where they're debating about how we're going to debate, where they're debating about where we're going to debate, debating about the format of the debate, debating about uh, you know every possible little thing they can pick at before the debate ever takes place, right? Uh, it's kind of like, it, it reminds me a lot of like a boxing match or a UFC match, you know, where at least some fighters think that, you know, half the battle or 30, you know, uh, three fourths of the battle is what takes place before you ever enter the ring, right? So you've got, uh, what's his name? Uh, McGregor. Uh, I forget his name. McGregor uh, always engaging in this pre-debate uh, debate banter, where he's trying to, you know, put down his opponent. Obviously, they're trying to, you know, psychologically uh, get in the person's head. You know, Muhammad Ali used to do it. Some of it's entertaining. In fact, it's entertaining. That's why they do it. They're trying to, in, in the case of fighters, they're trying to uh, psych the other person out, and they're trying to draw attention to their fight. I understand that. But when it comes to these sorts of debates, I'm thinking, I just want to discuss the issue. I'm not interested in some kind of cafeteria food fight, uh, you know, or, or any of this other stuff that goes on for other people prior to the debates. I've got too much to do then to, to engage in that sort of thing. So maybe you guys can return the favor to Jake Brock Brancatella, just like I've got Muslims coming on my channel saying, why are you running from Jake? Go on Jake's channel. Don't say you're running, but say, hey, Anthony Rogers has said he's willing to debate you. Uh, you know, will you take up his challenge and debate him? Okay. Um, all right. So Sal says it's a waste of time debating Muslims about issues they don't believe in. So here, here's my here's my view on this and why I do some of this. There's more than one reason for debating besides trying to persuade the person you're debating. Okay, one reason for doing it is simply to glorify God, right? Even if that person doesn't convert, I have, if nothing else, proclaimed God's truth. Even if nobody converts as a result of these debates, I have glorified God, right? God has been proclaimed and he, you know, he's been glorified and this will be part and parcel of the judgment at the final day. The Lord will be able to say, you know, I sent my servants to you, right? You didn't listen to them. Now, of course, I'm not saying people have an excuse if, if, if I don't, you know, if, if I don't in particular say it to them, they have the witness of their own conscience. Uh, they've heard, the gospel in other ways, other, other, you know, people and means have, have exposed them to the gospel in, in many cases, not in all cases, but, uh, it glorifies God, right? It glorifies God to proclaim his truth and to defend it. Secondly, it strengthens the faith of Christians when they see God's truth being capably defended and not just defended, but vindicated in public debate it strengthens their faith and it emboldens them, them then to live more heartily for Christ and also to witness to others. It gives them the confidence to do the sorts of things that scripture calls us to do. Um, a third reason that I engage in these debates is because these people who are otherwise so overconfident in the truth of their position the, the reason they, they run around, it's kind of like, I, well, going back to my boxing analogy, remember, I remember a long time ago, 
somebody kept saying they have a plan, they have a plan or something like that. Like they're going to beat up Tyson. They're going to beat up Tyson. And then P Tyson says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the nose. <laughs> right. Everybody's got a plan about how they're going to beat this guy until they get punched in the nose. Well, these guys are so overconfident because they're either talking to their own fan base or they're finding people who aren't familiar with at least their particular angle. And, you know, they're, they're, they're picking off low hanging fruit. Okay. This, it's just like, again, the fighter picking, uh, opponents that, uh, he knows he can beat. Right. Um, so when you engage somebody that has that kind of overconfidence and you take the wind out of their sails, they're not as likely or certainly not as zealously or confidently going to, uh, you know, prattle on in the future unless they just have a completely seared conscience. But, you know, if, if you effectively, you know, take the wind out of their sails, if you uh, show them that their confidence is misplaced, then they should, they should, and in some cases will not be quick to enter the fray again. And so I will have, if I am successful, I will have uh, protected other people by doing this because at least now, maybe this person won't be quick to turn around and say these sorts of things to somebody else. All right. So th those are some of the things um, that, that I'm thinking about when I debate. Now, I do also hope that the person I'm debating will see the truth of what I'm saying and believe. But, you know, I'm, I, I, I realize there, there are many reasons to do a debate, and it's not just so that person can be divert, uh, converted. Um, and the, you know, the other thing is you, you never know, like e even in a debate, you never know what's going to stick with that person and when it might become relevant to them, right? Maybe down the road. In fact, I know stories of people who grew up in a Christian context. Their parents read the scriptures to them. Their parents taught them to read scripture, to memorize scripture, to meditate on scripture. And these children grew up, but didn't have faith. They never really repented and believed. But uh, there are occasions when these people will, will tell you that at some point, a verse of scripture that they read in their childhood suddenly flooded back into their memory in some particular context. And as a result of that, they were converted, right? So let's just say hypothetically, there have been numerous verses that people point to on this, but just take John 3, 16. Suppose a child in his reading of scripture reads across that. It's one of the texts he's memorized. Uh, he, he, he's been th taught by his parents to, to dwell upon it and so forth. But as he grows up, these things never really took hold in his heart and he doesn't exercise faith in Christ. But later in life, as he's going about and he finds himself in some difficult circumstances that makes him mindful or aware of God and of the fact of future judgment, the fact of his coming death, these sorts of things, the reality of death, the reality of his sin, the reality of God's justice, these things start to weigh upon him. And in that context, he remembers a verse of scripture like John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him or the ones believing in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I know accounts of people that can say they were converted because of something they heard in their childhood. I even, I even know a story. There's a famous uh, Puritan preacher who was a very studied theologian, but he wasn't converted. Okay, he was a studied theologian. The man knew scripture backwards and forwards, but he wasn't converted. One day he was preaching to his congregation, and he said while he was preaching, the truth of the word pierced his heart, 
And it was like the gates of heaven were open to him and he believed and repented and so forth. So apparently prior to that, he had been a hypocrite, right? But at this point, the word of God pierced his soul. And so, you know, I think when I'm, when I'm talking to these people in debate, maybe they're not going to convert during that debate. Maybe they won't a week later, a month later, a year later, five years later. But maybe something I've said will eventually pierce through. You know, God will cause his arrows to pierce their heart and, and bring them to faith. Um, all right. So Arabian Prince says, what happens to innocent Muslims on Judgment Day? By innocent, I mean they were brainwashed by Muhammad. Hence, God knew this would happen. So... I'm glad you qualified innocent, but uh, even that though, uh, we we have to we have to go to a text like Romans one, which actually deals with this, right? Romans one tells us. In fact, let me go there. Let me share my screen. Here's what Romans 1 says. Now, I want to say going into this, because it isn't apparently said often enough, and a lot of people are confused. Jake Brancatella is confused. Uh, a lot of people will read this text of Scripture as a description of what's called natural theology. Okay. This text in Romans 1.18 is not talking about natural theology. Okay, What is natural theology? What the text isn't talking about. And what is the text talking about? So natural theology is what people are engaging in when they construct arguments for the existence of God from certain notions or facts, right? So, for example, take the cosmological argument. There are different versions of the cosmological argument. So don't take this as a, a description of all of these. I, I recognize that there are, there are various forms of arguments for God's existence based on the causal notion, okay? And those are called cosmological arguments. But a basic form of the cosmological argument is that everything has a cause, or more sophisticated forms would say everything that exists or begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Okay, this is an example of what's called natural theology. Okay, that's discovering certain premises, seeing them in relation to each other, and then drawing out the conclusion from those premises, right? So you have these principles like the causal notion, uh, the idea that everything that begins to exist has a cause. So you establish these premises and from them you derive the conclusion that there is a cause. And of course, in the context of these arguments, the idea is that the cause is God, okay? Now I'm not arguing for or against that sort of thing, okay? Then there are also other kinds of arguments. There's the teleological argument, which are arguments from design. There's the ontological argument, which is an argument uh, for God's existence based on the idea of the existence of, of a, a great being or the greatest of all beings, right? Uh, Anselm is supposed to have been the progenitor of this. Some would say Augustine, but there are different versions of this, just like there are different versions of the cosmological argument. But uh, the idea there is that uh, you have this notion of this, uh, you know, there, there's a, uh, the greatest conceivable being uh, must exist because it's greater to exist than not to exist, right? And again, I'm not trying to spell out all of this for you, but all of these ideas are, are the, the idea is that man is beginning without a knowledge of God. He does have knowledge of these other things or is able to discover them like the causal notion or the idea of design or this notion of being or the greatest of all conceivable beings. Man has these notions and from them can infer 
as a conclusion the existence of God. Okay, that is not what Romans one is talking about. Okay, again, I, I just want to be clear for the sake of those that know what natural theology is. I want you to be clear that I'm not making any point here about whether you should or shouldn't engage in that sort of thing. I'm only making this distinction so that you can understand what Romans 1 is saying. This is not what Romans 1 is saying. Now, now read the verse with me. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Okay. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations or their reasonings, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And then it goes on to talk about God giving them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity and so forth, because they exchanged the truth about God. Because they exchanged the truth about God, God gave them over to exchanging the natural desire uh, of men for women and women for men. Uh, they gave them over to exchanging their natural desire uh, for the opposite sex to a desire for the same sex. That's God's judgment on those who, uh, uh, one of his judgments, Paul's not being exhaustive here. But when you go back, you'll notice Paul is not talking about somebody engaging in a discursive process of reasoning whereby they, first of all, establish certain premises and then, from them, if they reason correctly, come to the conclusion that God probably exists, or something along those lines. Paul's not talking about natural theology. He's talking about general revelation. He's not talking about man discovering God. He's talking about God revealing himself to man. Okay, That's decidedly different than what's going on in natural theology. Natural theology is man's efforts to arrive at truth about God through a process of discursive reasoning, right? Premise one, premise two, conclusion, you know, sub-premise, all that kind of stuff. Paul is talking about what God has done. God has revealed, right? The wrath of God is revealed, okay, actively. God is the one doing this. God has revealed or the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. God has revealed himself to all men. He has made it evident to them. And then it goes on to say, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what's been made. So creation is the medium of this revelation, but the fact is God has revealed himself and he's revealed himself through creation to all men. And notice Paul says, so that they are without excuse. Okay. He doesn't say merely that they should have concluded with all probability that God exists. He says they have no excuse. Okay. They are completely without excuse for not believing in God. Moreover, notice that Paul, when he talks about Natural theology here, if you want to call it that, it's a natural atheology. What is it? How is it that men are responding to this revelation of God? General revelation has come to men, leaving them without excuse. And what is it that men are doing? What does Paul think of this natural theology? Here's what men are doing by nature. They are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. That's what human beings are doing in response to God's revelation, okay? his general revelation. And then it goes on. It says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations, right? And then he goes on uh, to talk about uh, uh, them becoming fools and so forth. So man is not presented as uh, rightly reasoning upon 
propositions that he discovered or facts that he's discovered, man is portrayed as suppressing clearly revealed knowledge given to him about God. Now, there's one other point that I want to make. In Romans 1, in uh, verse 21 right here, it says, for even though they knew God, in Greek, it's uh, uh, nantes ton theon, knowing the God. Okay, he uses the, it's articular there. And, and what Paul is driving at, following the grammar, is not merely that people have the, no, uh, the notion of a deity, some kind of a God, a God, you know, God in general, which is what the arguments from natural theology are intended to establish. They're just trying to establish that there's a God of some sort, whatever that God might be. Right. That's why if you hear William Lane Craig, for example, William Lane Craig will say, you first establish the existence of a God. It's not intended to prove the God of Christianity. And then you move on to arguments or evidence for the truth of Christianity, that Jesus is the son of God and so forth. So he says there's basically a two-step procedure. First, arguments for the existence of a God, and then a second step where you're arguing specifically for the truth of Christianity as the, as the uh, uh, specific content of you know, who that God is and so forth. But again, Paul is talking here not about natural theology. He's talking about general revelation. And Paul says through general revelation, people know not simply a God, that there is a God, you know, some sort of heavenly whatchamacallit, you know, like heavenly tapioca or something. Paul says they knew the God. It's the true God that all men know through his revelation in nature. And by the way, Paul doesn't only say that God has made himself to men through the world around about us, but also through man's internal constitution. Okay, in Romans chapter 2, Paul says that people... Uh, uh, you know, that God has revealed himself, his standards of conduct to men through their conscience. So both external to man and internal to man is this knowledge of God in terms of which they know him. They know themselves as his image bearers. They know themselves as obligated to him, as responsible to give him thanks and so forth. But they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so how does this all relate to the original question? What happens to Muslims who have been brainwashed? According to Romans 1, every Muslim, now it's funny, M Muslims have this concept too, by the way, but it's, it's very distorted and weird, okay? Muslims have this concept that everyone knows God by virtue of what they call fitra, okay? It almost sounds like if, if they only tell you this much, it almost sounds like Christianity, right? Muslims will say that everybody born into the world has a natural and innate knowledge of God, a, a disposition towards the right belief in God, okay? Now, they would say Tawheed, right? Uh, they're, everybody's born upon Tawheed. The Hadith say that everybody is born upon Fitra, that is, the right disposition of, of faith in the true God, it's his parents who make a person a Jew, a Christian, or a polytheist. Okay, that's what Muhammad says in the Hadith. So this almost sounds Christian, right? Everybody's born with this innate knowledge of God. But here's what, uh, there, it, it's not really talking about general revelation or anything like that. The Quran says in Surah 7, it, it talks about uh, people being taken out of Adam's loins. The Hadith expand on this and tell us that when Allah created Adam, he stroked Adam's back with his hand. So Allah has a hand, right? Allah stroked Adam's back with his hand and brought out of it all of his future descendants. And all of his future descendants were then made to stand before him and acknowledge that he's the only God. So they were required... These, these little semens are all taken out of Adam's. Notice, by the way, that Allah is stroking Adam's back. Why would Allah stroke Adam's back? You know, first of all, it assumes he has a hand, but 
Why would he stroke Adam's back in order to bring out Adam's future progeny? Why would that be the means of Allah extracting from Adam's loins his seed? <laughs> Think about it, folks. What's one of those marvelous scientific mistakes found in the Quran? Okay, so the, the Quran teaches that semen proceeds from between the backbone and the ribs. Okay, that's what the Quran says. So understandably then, when the Hadith talks about Allah taking out Adam's future descendants, it speaks of Allah stroking Adam's back. <laughs> ah. I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up, folks. I mean, you have to be a 7th century Arab to get this uh, this stuff. But um, So Allah strokes Adam's back and causes everybody to stand before him. And that's why everybody... Uh, well, so then Allah places them all back inside of Adam. So when people are eventually born into the world, they've already had this sort of immediate encounter with Allah. And so everybody, okay, setting aside the word, the weird... Adam backstroking thing and all of that. Muslims will grant that everybody comes into the world knowing God, knowing the true God. We maintain that the true God is Jehovah. They maintain that the true God is Allah. According to the Bible, people come into the world as truth suppressors. It's, it's, not, it's not the case that people are Christians simply because they were born into a Christian family. Remember the stories that I was just telling you about people growing up in a Christian home, hearing the scriptures, not being converted, right? There can be people who outwardly profess faith in Christianity because that's what they were taught. That's not the same thing as conversion, right? That's not the same thing as having a regenerate heart. That's not the same thing as having repented and turned to Christ for salvation, Okay, simply being raised in a Christian home. Jesus had to upbraid the Jews for this, didn't he? And so did John the Baptist. Both of them said, you know, just because you're descendants of Abraham doesn't mean you're children of Abraham, right? It doesn't mean that you are spiritually Abraham's seed. So uh, the idea that Muslims who are taught to be Muslims are innocent. Okay, what you have to understand is that every religion that every person adopts, even, even uh, a nominal form of Christianity, right? Remember Paul talks about people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof? He's talking about people who are religious outwardly. They profess faith and that sort of thing, but don't have the reality of the matter in themselves. Even that is something by which people are suppressing the truth. They have created a Christianity in their own image, or they've uh, adopted Islam, or they've adopted uh, Judaism, or Hinduism, or Buddhism, right? It, it, all of this is just that by which people are suppressing the truth, okay? So I don't think that there is, on the basis of Romans 1, any such thing as a person who is truly innocent in the sense that they have an excuse for not believing the truth about God. Paul says they are without excuse. Um, moreover, you know, we are told that uh, we're to preach the gospel to people, and we can see people who hear the truth and still reject it. And so even if it were the case, right, that somebody who didn't ever hear the gospel might have a get out of jail free card, and I'm not saying they do, but even if it were the case, it's certainly not the case for those who have heard the gospel, right? But actually, you know, it's not the case for anyone. The only way of salvation is through faith in Christ. Okay, that's crystal clear in Scripture. Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Peter in Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. He's talking about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 10, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Over and over again, it's clear the only way of salvation is through faith in Christ.
Um, oh yeah, Truth Defender said he hadn't thought about Allah uh, in his uh, uh, being the first masseuse in history, right? Uh, do you say masseuse or masseur? I, I can't remember what it is in the case of a male. Anyways, um, yeah, Allah was the first, gave the first back rub. Uh, he stroked Adam's back because Allah thinks that's where you find semen. <laughs> uh, um, all right, what time is it? It's 12 o'clock. I'll see if there's a couple more questions. Um, so Bine says, Muthi Abulaith is so funny. His laugh is amazing. You know, his laugh is incredible. Um, but I noticed that Mufti Abu Laith hasn't been doing his live, uh, his, his Monday nights with, with Mufti since the scoundrels broke into his home and terrorized his wife and daughters, you know, breaking into his house and everything. So I don't know what his plan is. I think it's a shame that, I mean, I, you know, he, he has to make whatever decision he makes, but I think it's a shame. He had he had a good Monday night show. He was uh, he's still wrong. He's a Muslim. He needs Christ, but uh, he seemed like he had some humanity to him that seems to be missing with some of these other people. Not because I think they don't really bear the image of God, but because I think their religion causes them to, uh, you know suppress things to a degree that is, you know, when, when, when people suppress things, they can suppress things to a greater or lesser degree. Right. And I think that Islam is a religion that, you know, leads people to greater forms of truth suppression than you find in some other, uh, religious, you know, groups, you know, so, uh, you know, when you can when you can get a Muslim who, with good conscience, can go out there and you know slash the face of somebody like Hatun Tash, right? And the guy was probably really going for her neck, all because she is speaking against Islam or wearing a shirt uh, uh, that has a picture of a depiction of Muhammad on it. When you can have a person who's willing to do that in good conscience, right? It's because that person has adopted Islam and is engaging in a form of truth suppression that goes well beyond what you find in, in many other religions that I would also disagree with, right? Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, yeah, Faith Over Fear said what those people did to Mufti was wrong. Sal says, the spirit will guide us to bring those who belong to Christ. I don't preach. I torture demons. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's see. So, Muta Kabir Sudat says, I'm Muslim. My name is one of the 99 names of Allah. It means the boastful one and supremely great. Okay. Um, I thought you were going to make a comment or ask a question, but that's fine. Just explaining your name to us. Um, M says, would you ever debate Sam on reformed theology now that he calls it man-made theology or latent flowers? Um, so he here's the thing about some of that. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things involved in this. I know people always think this, right? Because uh, because of various reasons. But I was actually asked to debate Leighton Flowers. Marlon Wilson asked me, and I don't think what Leighton Flowers asked Marlon to ask me. I think Marlon Wilson was just trying to organize a debate. Um, and I said, you know, I got to be honest. I've never really listened to Leighton Flowers. And in order for me, even if I'm familiar with the theological issues, I still want to know the particular individual that I would be engaging because, I mean, again, I keep using these fighting analogies. When fighters go into a ring, they always study their opponents, right? And I don't mean that antagonistically, uh, but 
people always have these nuances. There, there's all these different versions of, uh, you know, what, you know, there, in the history of the church, you have things like Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. Both of those have been condemned by more church councils than any other heresy in church history, right? Even anti-Trinitarian heresies. So Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism have been condemned. Some of these versions of anti-reformed theology are actually semi-Pelagian. And I'd want to know if the person I'm talking to is semi-Pelagian because that becomes a relevant issue, right? They need to hear your position is against the entire history of the Christian church with respect to those particular issues, or at least uh, the, the, you know all these councils. But th th there's not just Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. There are different versions of what would qualify as Arminianism. So I heard, uh, in fact, let me say this. Uh, one person I like a lot who's not Reformed is Mike Winger. Okay. Um, thank you, Jack Ray, for that coffee fund. I, I like Mike Winger. Uh, I've met Mike. You know, we haven't had extensive conversation before, but I think Mike's a great guy. And even when I listen to him on Calvinism, you know, he doesn't ruffle my feathers or anything. He's not a Calvinist. Um, but I, I get the impression that he is sincere. Uh, he he studies the word. He, he does a really good job on all sorts of issues, right? Um, and so, uh, but I was surprised. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I was surprised when he, he said one day, I heard him say, he doesn't believe in prevenient grace. Now, let me explain that to you. Oops. Um, even though Arminians, like classic, like Wesleyan Arminians, are not Calvinistic, one of the reasons they were still considered evangelical. Okay, here, here, let me explain. The word evangel means gospel. And evangelical is one then who believes in the gospel. And this was a alternative way of referring to Protestants, those who come out of the Reformation. And by the way, all of the magisterial reformers from Luther to Calvin to Zwingli to Beza, uh, you know, to Farrell to Verrett, uh, all these names, all these guys to a man believed in uh, the sort of thing that uh, we're talking about, you know, that I'm talking about. But one of the things that they were mainly concerned with is just preserving the idea that the gospel by which we are saved is uh, all to the glory of God, right? That God alone is the one who saves us. Salvation is solely by grace, solely through faith, solely on account of Christ. So they were trying to, you know, take all glory from man, give all glory to God, uh, take merit out of the picture and, and all of that. Well, one of the reasons that, uh, like there was a great friendship between John Wesley, who was an Arminian, and George Whitfield, who was one of the, uh, you know, great uh, preachers of, of the Great Awakening, right? Whitfield and, and Wesley were, got along famously, right? Even though one was Reformed and one was uh, Arminian. But one of the things that Wesley taught was he did believe that man was depraved and incapable of coming to Christ. But, he said, God pours out what he calls prevenient grace. Grace that enables totally depraved people to choose Christ. So apart from this grace, they wouldn't be able to choose. But, but the difference for Wesley was that this grace was given to everyone, right? And people who don't come to Christ were choosing not to make use of this grace. Now, Reformed people obviously don't think of prevenient grace that way, but at least you can see here that Wesley was attributing people coming to Christ to grace. So he was recognizing that even in coming to Christ, people were ultimately indebted to Christ, right? That's what made Wesley's Arminianism evangelical. That's what made it 
the case that Whitfield and Wesley, it's one of the reasons that made them, you know, so amicable towards each other because Whitfield was anxious to preserve the graciousness of the gospel. And Wesley was arguing for this notion of prevenient grace, which says that man is, is depraved, incapable of coming to Christ, but God in his graciousness has given grace to all men, enabling them to come to Christ. So what I was surprised about with Mike Winger was I assumed, I assumed for a long time that Mike Winger be believed in prevenient grace. And I was shocked hearing him the other day saying he doesn't believe in prevenient grace. And I thought, my lens, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's shocking to me, right? Um, but in any case, uh, so uh, I know I was answering a, a, a different question here, but um, I bring that up because if I were to do a debate with somebody like Leighton Flowers, I'd want to spend time finding out what his particular positions are on a variety of issues. And, and part of the problem with doing that is I'm so focused on so many other things, right? I, I have more zeal to debate anti-Trinitarians, to debate people who oppose the God of Scripture, the Christ of Scripture, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the necessity of faith and repentance, that sort of thing. I have much greater zeal spending my time engaging people of that stripe who are clearly on the other side of the Christian, non-Christian divide than I do debating people who make some profession of faith in Christ. Now, when it comes to Sam in particular, one of the things you guys have to understand is that Sam and I go way back. Uh, you know, I love Sam to pieces. So I don't hear all of Sam's anti-reformed and anti-Calvinist stuff. Usually I skip those broadcasts, right? But Sam knows I love him to pieces. Uh, you know, I, I was reading stuff from Sam back in the late 90s, right? And I was a co-author with Sam, David, other people on Answering Islam for, I don't know, um, I, I can't remember when I first started writing for Answering Islam. It goes back... Um, about 15 years or so, I don't know. Um, and of course, we've uh, you know done numerous things together. So the, the, the difficulty when it comes to Sam is that you know when I debate people, I, I kind of like to have the option of, of being uppity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I, and I don't mean being uh, mean. I, I just mean that if 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 somebody is if somebody attacks the triune God, they blaspheme the triune God, they blaspheme Christ, right? They ridicule the gospel. I reserve the right to give as good as I get, right? Tit for tat, you shoot my dog, I'll kill your cat. Um, with somebody like Sam, I, I'm not going to have that kind of. Uh, you know, I, I just don't have that kind of personal thing towards him. I have nothing but love for Sam. Now I know that Sam, because Sam says, so I'm just I'm just quoting Sam here. I know that Sam can become, uh, you know, uh, more excitable in some contexts, and uh, you know, but. I, I think, I mean, just put it this way. I, if I were to debate somebody, I'd want to study that person. I mean, and honestly, I don't even know what Sam's views, what his alternative views are on some things, right? I know that he's forsaken uh, classical Protestant orthodoxy, but I don't know. There, there's numerous versions that this can take, right? Uh, and I honestly don't know what the alternatives are are that he's staked out on these these different issues um but i you know i do want you know the last time i saw sam i was hoping we could talk about some of it so i could you know get from him what he where he's at on some of that but anyways bottom line is this uh love sam to pieces always will don't agree with the direction he's taken on certain issues, but I'm also not overly familiar with his particular alternatives 
that he's staked out on those issues. Right. So I can't say what my view would be regarding those things. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, just to show you how close I am with Sam, just so you understand my my daughter here, who's 19. She was flying out to see my mom, her grandma, who lives in Nevada. Right. She lives about an hour outside of Las Vegas. And her plane you know, I took her to the airport. Uh, her plane went through Arizona, Phoenix, and then was supposed to go to Vegas. And it got over Vegas, but there was some kind of storm and it couldn't, the, the plane couldn't land. And I, I still kind of puzzle over why they did what they did, but they, they went all the way back to Phoenix and then landed. I mean, I understand if there's weather conditions, they can't land, but it just seemed weird to me that, you know, they're, they're like right there. And I mean, I don't know. So they went back to uh, Phoenix and uh, they tell my daughter that they're not going to be able to go to Vegas until the next day. So she's going to have to go find a hotel. And I'm over there sort of, you know, anxious over all of this because here's my daughter She's not streetwise and all of that. She grew up in a Christian home in a very Christian context. And I'm thinking my 19-year-old daughter is out there. She's going to go out and what? Look for a hotel in Phoenix? You know, I'm familiar with Phoenix. I know what Phoenix is like. And so I immediately, um, I called Sam because Sam lives in Arizona. I called Sam and I said, hey, my daughter, uh, my daughter is is out there and there's this issue and Sam at the drop of a hat was going to go pick up my daughter. Okay. So Sam's a close friend, loves Sam, would do anything for Sam, vice versa. That doesn't mean that I agree with those new theological positions he's staked out. Um, you know, but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, anyways, I hope that was an answer. I mean, I, I just don't have, I mean, it's not, I don't want to be misunderstood. It's not like I don't have a firm conviction in the positions I hold on these issues. It's not like I don't have zeal for these issues. These are the, the very things, when I put my head on the pillow at night, I do so resting in the all comprehensive sovereignty of God, Right. I don't know how people put their head on the pillow at night if that's not ultimately the ground of their hope and their confidence. Okay. And I'm not just using lingo that all Christians like to use. I'm using sovereignty in the true sense of the term, right? I believe in the all comprehensive sovereignty of God. That's why I can put my head on the pillow at night. That's why I will walk into any situation, you know, because I'm convinced that not a hair can fall from my head apart from the will of my father in heaven. I don't know how people get through their days without that confidence, without that notion of God and so forth. I understand all the ridicule that's hurled at it and so forth, but that's my conviction. So it's not that I don't have a firm conviction in that. It's my, you know, the, my very heartbeat, the source of my confidence. Second, it's not that I don't have a zeal for this. I certainly do. It's where should I spend my time? I've been engaged in apologetics for a long time. And so do I want to spend my time arguing with other people who profess faith in Christ, or do I want to spend my time engaging open enemies of the gospel, right? And for my uh, part, that's just, that's how I choose to spend my time. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying I'd never be willing to do a debate with somebody like Leighton Flowers, but it's not a front burner issue for me. Um, yeah. MG says, Sovereign God, that's the beauty of Reformed theology. Let God have all the glory. <laughs> all right, folks. So if there is no further question, let me thank all. Actually, I did see Arabian Prince. Thank you so much for your support. I really, really appreciate it. I'm sorry I didn't put that on the screen. And uh, thank you, Raymond. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, you got good news today. I'm, I'm going to assume you're going to Facebook me the, the good news. So I don't know if Raymond, 
wants me spouting out the issue that I'm hoping the good news relates to. Uh, so I won't say anything, but uh, if it's if it's good, if it's the good news I'm thinking of, folks, then it's really good news and you should all rejoice with him. Um, but I'm hoping you're going to message me on Facebook and tell me what that good news is. Uh, but here, here it is. Thank you, Arabian Prince, for that support. I really appreciate it. You guys help me do what I do. Um, all right, folks, I'm going to conclude with that. I hope this was a blessing to you. More to come on Mark 1, 4 through 8. We need to talk about John the Baptist. We need to talk about that whole business of John's baptism being a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but Christ's baptism being a baptism with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to talk about uh, all sorts of things related to that. Uh, a lot of great stuff to come. Today, as a summary, uh, the Old Testament speaks of God as a warrior. God is portrayed as a warrior who do, does battle against the enemies of his people. He helps them. He's the source of their strength when they're in battle. He also goes out before them and engages the battle. Um, but God is also the one who battles their spiritual enemies. He's the one who ultimately uh, engages uh, the foe, defeats the tempter uh, at the time of the Exodus and ultimately at the cross. So Jesus is being portrayed in the New Testament as the divine warrior, the strong man, the mighty God who has come to bind Satan. He is the stronger one who is able to bind the strong man. Uh, and thank you, Binet, uh, for that uh, as well. Thank you so much. All right. God bless you folks. Have a great evening. I'll see you next time, Lord willing.